you. Um, yeah, so brilliant butterflies. Um, so they're brilliant in many ways, really. They're brightly coloured and beautiful. And they've got very interesting life histories, particularly some of them, and we'll talk about later. And um, also they're very good measures of how of how good the environment is, the state of the environment, really. And I'm just noticing I've misspelled butterflies, but never mind, we'll get past that. So as Zoe said, Butterfly Conservation's Big Butterfly Count is coming up shortly, and I would encourage you to get involved. Um, there's uh, the dates are the Friday the 16th of July to Sunday the 8th of August. And essentially the idea is that you choose a spot which may be a garden and you just spend 15 minutes looking around and seeing what butterfly species there are and you record them and the number that you record is the greatest number of anyone that you see it at any one time or alternatively you can do it as a walk and just uh, count the butterflies you see on a walk and then they can be entered uh, to the Butterfly Conservation website or via a Big Butterfly Count app that you can download from the website. And, uh, and then the, all, all the results are put, put together and analysed comparing you know, one year with another. So that's the um, address, the web address that you need to, to, to look at. But I'll show that again at the end of the talk, actually. So don't worry about it for now. So when you go on the website you can download this big butterfly count identification chart uh, and you know most of the species are, e are easy to identify and uh, we'll we'll just show you most of them now and give you some pointers to probably the white butterflies are the most difficult to, to identify so once we've done the these butterflies that are in the big butterfly count we'll go on to talk about some interesting life histories to show you how fascinating they can be and then mention how butterflies have declined in general over the decades and what you can do about it to help in your own gardens so whoops um, right so here we are here's the speckled wood so mating pair of speckled woods there uh, common butterfly um, which you're highly likely to see and here's the meadow brown. So this is a female with a large patch of orange on the forewing. The male is very similar, but the orange patch is rather smaller. And there we are, there's the underside of the meadow brown, a mating pair there. And this is the hedge brown or gatekeeper, one of our few butterflies that uh, has two different vernacular names. So this is a female with a large orange patch here on the forewing. And then there's the male, which has a dark brown finger going within this orange patch. And the marbled white, probably not many of you will see it in your garden, but it is possible. But that's certainly on the big butterfly count list. The peacock, unmistakable, as is the red admiral. And the small tortoiseshaw. And the comma. There's some lovely commas flying around at the moment, actually, in my garden, so you're highly likely to see these. So this is the comma at rest in the autumn. You see it's on an old apple leaf here, and you can see apples in the background. And it's got this very jagged edge to its wing, looking rather like a dead leaf. This is the comma mark, which gives it its name, and it's got this dark underside to the forewing. So um, in the autumn, later in the autumn, it'll find a place to rest for the winter, an overwinterous an adult butterfly. And here we are in a wood in Newton Abbott. And amazingly, Amanda Hunter found these, but she'd found in exactly the same place, a comma overwintering two years previously, didn't look in the intervening year. And then last winter, in exactly the same place, found these three commas. There's one here, one here, and one here. So this is the middle of winter and they found this bit of an oak tree where the dead oak leaves have not fallen off or they've got um, stuck amongst a conglomeration of twigs there and really they're very difficult to see. It amazes me actually how they 
work out where to go because when it's they they must find their overwintering place really before all the leaves are off the oak tree so there must be plenty of other leaves on the tree that are going to fall off or maybe they just move around a little bit but there we are to quite a good find that so in the spring they wake up and they go out and find a nectar source and here's one nectaring on some plum blossom and then they'll make lay their eggs and produce another generation which is what's out now but this one you see it's much paler on the underside and it's not actually quite as jagged uh, so this we call variety Hutchinsoni. So this is the second generation, which becomes sexually mature quickly, mates and lays eggs, and then will produce a further generation, which will emerge in early autumn, and then the life cycle continues. So as I say, the white butterflies are the ones that are going to give you the most trouble in identifying. And the thing is that you should only really record them if you're certain which it is. It's not much use to any citizen science project if you're just guessing what, what you've got. So this is a large white from the, from the underside, so a very plain underside. And you can just see this, the black on the tip of the forewing on the top side is showing through and it comes you know, fairly well down to about here. So if we look at the top side, the black in the tip of the wing comes way down about two thirds of the way down this edge of the wing. And this is a female with these two black spots here. The male just has, has one black spot. And, uh, but, but still it's this black tip to the wing with the black coming right down to here that gives it away. I mean, if you're experienced, the fact that it's so much bigger than the others will suffice. But if you're not very used to looking at them, then seeing one on its own, the size may not be completely helpful to you. So just remember the extent of the, that black marking. So there's two other species that could be confused with the small white and the green veined white. So this is a small white with a black tip to its wing like that, but it's not coming right down here like the large white. This is a male with one black spot there. And it's actually a second generation male, the sort that would be around now, really. Those that uh, come out earlier in the year tend to have no black spot there or, or a very reduced black spot. And then there's the underside, rather, which looks rather like the uh, large white. And the female small white, like the large white, would have two black spots on the forewing. This is the green veined white. So you've got a sort of dusting of uh, black here. And you can just see that the, the, there's darkening along the veins here. So if you were experienced, you could probably reliably say that was a green veined white from the top side, but it's much better to see the underside. So if we look at the underside of the green veined white, you can see this shading along the veins of the wing which uh, give it its name. And uh, the I should have said actually that the, well, I'll just go back. Um, so this is a first generation with no black spots here. First generation male, the second generation um, would have a black spot or in the first generation may have a tiny tiny hint of a black spot but uh, so that's the difference they do vary from one generation to the other underside again this is the female with these two much darker much bigger black spots and uh, the black at the tip of the wing this is just sort of shading along the veins rather than as in the large white it coming right whoops sorry coming coming right down here Right, and the brimstone, so here's the brimstone butterfly, so this is a pair of them. The male is yellow and the female is this pale whitish green colour. Now really it's a butterfly that only in Devon uses alder buckthorn as a food plant and alder buckthorn is really a tree of the heathlands. So that's where it's going to breed but 
you know, the butterflies do actually wander far and wide, especially the males. So you may well see one wandering through your garden. And then if we close in on the female, there's the female, which is a sort of whitish green color. In fact, at a distance can look rather like a large white when it's in, in flight. And then the small copper, in fact, there's a mating pair of small coppers, which was on a ragwort flower in my garden. And a common blue. So the common blue does wander all over the place. I mean, the food plant is principally common birds for trefoil. We'll use other trefoils and rest harrow. So in your garden, you, you could see the common blue or the holly blue. So common blue is sort of got this blue all around the, the wing, the male, and will be tending to fly low to the ground. This is a female. Now, the important thing is all these orange spots around the edge of the wing. So any female common blue will have that. But the amount of blue on it will vary. This is quite an extreme example with as much blue as it would ever have. But there may be very little blue and it may be almost entirely brown. And then from the underside, the notice the pattern of spotting on the common blue. So you've got these black spots with a white circle, these orange spots around the edge of the hind wings and the forewing. Right, this is the holly blue now. So the holly blue is more likely to be flying up around bushes. And this is the male. And you can see it's just got this rim of blackish scales just here at the tip of the wing. Whereas the female is quite different. It has this broad black band around the edge of the wing. And on the underside, the underside looks very different from the common blue with these um, grayish blue coloration and the black spots and dashes there. And this one was flying up and down a, a wet patch of ground in the Bovey Valley woods. And it was, alighting from time to time on this bird dropping here. And it was actually feeding from it. So presumably gaining some minerals that it needed from this, from this bird dropping in the, in the damp patch. Now for the first time, three moths are included in the big butterfly count. So they're on your chart. And uh, this is the Jersey tiger moth, which you're more likely to see in the South Devon than North, but it is, um, venturing into North Devon now. And it uh, was first found in the UK in Torquay in the second half of the 1800s. And there it remained for a long time. And then, you know, by the 1970s, it got to East Devon. But very recently, it's gone undergone a tremendous range expansion. So it's really pretty much all along Southern England now, and particularly around London and North of London, where it may even have been a, a, a fresh immigration event that uh, seeded the population there. So that's doing quite well. And the six spot burnet, probably not a garden moth, but um, depends where you're doing your big butterfly count. If you're out in a meadow where there's bird's foot trefoil, you're highly likely to, to see this moth. So in damp meadows in Devon, you may get the five spot burnet where one of the, where that spot's missing and you've just got this spot. So one, two, three, four, that would be five, whereas this is a six spot burnet with the sixth spot. And finally, the silver Y, which is a migrant moth, which come, which reaches our shores in large numbers in the summer and actually makes a return migration in the autumn. And you can often see these uh, buzzing around and nectaring on the flowers. Right, so that was pretty much Big Butterfly Count. Do have a look at the um, website and you can download the chart, as I say, and uh, it tells you what to do and you can enter your data. It's a really good thing to do. So now we'll get on to interesting life histories. So this is the White Admiral Butterfly, which you're unlikely to see in your garden, but uh, does have a particularly intricate and interesting life cycle. So this one, this is a picture was taken on Devon Wildlife Trust's Bovey Heath, actually. But um, so the White Admiral, curiously, 
lays its eggs in deep shady woodland. And this is an example of the sort of place it would, uh, it would lay its eggs. In fact, this leaf here has been attacked by a white admiral larva. So we'll crop the image and you can see that it's, it's fed right back to here and it looks as if it's eaten all this leaf here. But as we'll see in a moment, it hasn't really eaten all that, but that's a very typical feeding sign and quite easy to find in the right place in August. So to give you another idea of how deep and shady this woodland is, this is uh, a group of people looking at a white admiral larva about six o'clock in the evening in the middle of August. So we're using a torch so that we can get a good view of it. So it really is shady conditions that it, it uses. And it's because it wants stressed honeysuckle, miserable honeysuckle, finding it difficult to, to grow properly and just stressed. So the white admiral lays its egg usually on the edge of a honeysuckle leaf. So there it is, and if we crop the image, we can see this intricate sculpturing on the white admiral egg. And when the caterpillar hatches out, the first bit of the plant's defense it's got to overcome is these hairs, but it manages to navigate them and it makes its way to the tip of the leaf. And then it starts nibbling away at the tip of the honeysuckle leaf here and here. And it doesn't digest that food properly. It passes it quickly through the gut and produces these yellowish frass pellets indicating that it hasn't properly digested it. But it's really, it's clearly really important to the caterpillar that it does this because here you can see it's been attaching these frass pellets to the tip of the leaf with silk. So by later on the same day, it will have done this. So it's made a quite a significant extension to the leaf here from the tip, which we call a pier. And it's digesting the food better now and it's producing dark frass pellets and some of them it's attached to itself. It eats in this side and eats in the other side of the leaf. So here it is, it's using the pier on which to rest. And then it'll start feeding again. So this is what it does. It eats in from the edge of the leaf like this to the middle, and then it's gonna cut out this flag of leaf and drop it down like it has the other side, and it'll attach it to the midrib with some silk fabric, fab, um, fragments. So as I say, from the original picture I showed you, it hadn't really eaten all that leaf. The midrib looked longer than it really was because of the pier extension. And these flags of leaf are being dropped down rather than actually eaten. But it does make it easy to find these things. And there we are further on. It's um, now resting on its pier again. And it's got these frass pellets, it's stuck to its back. And you can see more leaf fragments, flags of leaf being held down here. And it's continuing the same feeding pattern in here. And so it goes on, more of the same. And again, more of the same. Now, now you can see the pier here quite distinct from the midrib. The midrib's been covered with silk, which makes it easier for the caterpillar to move along it. it doesn't have to negotiate the hairs. More and more leaf fragments accumulated here. And you'll notice some little black spots here. These are frass pellets that have been deposited in this structure. So we know it as an, as an aerial latrine, but why, why it does this, we don't really understand, but it continues its same feeding pattern. And then at the end, end of its first instar, it rests on this pier and it hangs around there for a bit, ready to shed its skin. So when it sheds its skin, it takes on this more slightly more spiky appearance and continues the same feeding pattern. And one thing it does is it sews the petiole of the honeysuckle to the stem. And you can see all these silk strands where it's done that. And as I say, it's, um, it's really scrappy honeysuckle it's using. And in August in this wood, 
the conditions can be pretty dry and the leaves tend to fall off the honeysuckle. So by doing this, it ensures that the leaf it's feeding on won't drop to the ground. And then it sheds its skin once more to get in, into its third instar. And essentially it's continuing the same feeding pattern and its uh, aerial latrine is getting bigger. So here we are looking from the side. There is the aerial latrine, looking a neater basket now, really. But you'll notice that to start with, when it was first making it, it was here. And now it's actually moved the latrine this way along the midrib. And it does it by cutting this, uh, cutting a silk strand here. And then it catches hold of the latrine here and hitches it up here with another strand of silk. And so you can see that in that way, that's how it moves it proximally along the midrib. And there's another shot close up, third in star lava and this aerial latrine. Very curious, we don't really understand it. And then at some point in the third in star, it gets ready to, for the winter. So this, you know, it's getting ready in August really, mostly, although sometimes a bit later to spend the winter. And the first thing it does, it cuts a notch out at the base of the leaf and the other side as well. And really this makes it much easier to fold the leaf. It attaches the petiole to the stem with silk. It spins a silk pad underneath it here on which it's now resting. And it cuts a channel from the edge of the leaf beyond the midrib, then spins silk and folds this part of the leaf over itself. So this is a hibernaculum, as we call it, in construction. And here's one that's been completed. And this is the usual way in which it's, the hibernaculum is done. But there are, there are another three variations on it. Sometimes, for example, it cuts right through the leaf here. But you can see here how this notch has been cut out. And they always do that. And I'm sure it's to make it easier to fold the leaf over. Here's another one. You can see the lava quite clearly. See all the silk strands. I mean, it's not going to blow off the stem, that's for sure. But otherwise, it's a fairly feeble structure in many ways. And here's another one. You can see how it's, uh, this is where the leaf's been eaten by the caterpillar. It's beaten a channel through just beyond the midrib, taken out its notch and folded the leaf over. Here's another one. Rear end of the caterpillar visible. And here's one in the middle of winter where it has, in this one, it did take the whole of the latter, the um, distal part of the leaf off. But you can see all these um, fibers here, these silk fibers. This is spider silk. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that was taken in the winter. So that's how, how it looks at that stage. You can just see a bit of the caterpillar poking out at the back. But as I say, it's, you know, the, the dead honeysuckle leaf itself is, you know, quite feeble, really, and it, it can disintegrate. And in this one, the sides of the hibernaculum had completely disintegrated, uh, leaving the caterpillar just attached to its silk pad. And here's another one where I think the hibernaculum must have got stuck to the honeysuckle twig by some moisture. And the caterpillar just left the hibernaculum and rested on the honeysuckle um, stem and managed to pass the winter successfully like that. So it's, uh, it's, never, it's not always necessarily quite the same, but the pattern of behavior is roughly the same all the time. Then in the spring, it starts feeding again. It sheds its skin and takes on a green appearance like this. This one's about to shed its skin for the final time as a caterpillar and uh, then becomes this rather splendid, ornate caterpillar, which is much harder to find than the early ones, which leave characteristic feeding damage. And of course, are much more numerous because there'll have been a lot of losses by the time they get to this stage. And it finds somewhere to hang itself up, sheds its skin to reveal this uh, extraordinary pupa with all its intricate shaping. So really, 
it's an interesting story, but also it's a story in many ways as of overcoming the plant's defences. Because what um, somebody did was to take newly hatched white admiral larvae and put them on the lush honeysuckle growing in the woodland ride. And what happened, the caterpillar started nibbling away at the leaf, but the leaf exuded a sticky substance which gummed up the caterpillar and it just couldn't cope with it and couldn't survive. So that's why the white admiral lays its eggs in the deep shady woodland on stressed scrappy honeysuckle which can't launch uh, proper defence against attack. Now this is a uh, feeding damage from a moth we don't get in Devon called the broad bordered bee hawk moth and it lays its eggs un on the underside of honeysuckle growing in the woodland ride so it's lush honeysuckle so the newly hatched larva makes a hole on the underside of the from the underside of the leaf and when the leaf starts exuding this sticky substance it just moves to the other side of the leaf and makes another hole but when it exudes a sticky substance again it comes to this side and so it, and so it goes on and you get these sort of parallel rows of um of little holes and then when the caterpillar is big enough it can cope with the sticky stuff and and all is well so there's a fully grown broad bordered bee hawk moth caterpillar and the moth itself, which is a splendid bumblebee mimic. Right, another interesting life cycle. This is the common blue butterfly, which you could see in your garden. Um, so it lays its egg, it's laid an egg here on common bird's foot trefoil. The caterpillar to start with sticks its head end, makes a hole, sticks its head end within the, the, the upper and lower epidermis, leads out the parenchyma of the leaf, effectively mining it, and there's the entry hole there. So there's the empty egg shell. And it can make feeding damage, is quite similar to this, which is a micromoth called Coleophora discordella. So the caterpillar makes this case out of fragments of, uh, of common bird's foot trefoil leaf and silk. And you can see here it's made a hole and mined the leaf. So there's some similarities between the two feeding damages. Then the fully grown common blue caterpillar looks like this. These white spots here are spiracles, but these two white spots here are tentacle organs. And this slit here is a honey gland or newcomer's gland on the seventh segment. So I tell you, it's one good advantage of doing a talk on Zoom, because if you were sitting at the back of a hall, you wouldn't be able to see this level of detail. But the blue butterflies have a close relationship with ants, which in the case of the large blue uh, is taken to a parasitic level. So we call it kleptoparasitism. And the large blue larva lives most of its life in the nest of an ant, and it eats the ant grubs and pupae. But in the case of the common blue, the common blue and the ants have a symbiotic relationship. The ants will feed on sugars secreted by this honey gland here. And, and also they get amino acids and sugars secreted by microscopic glands called pore cupola, which are all over the body of the caterpillar. And these tentacle organs must be something to do with communication with the ants, but we don't really understand it. So we'll have a look. Here's another one. Here's the, you can see the tentacle organs a bit better there. And there's the, the newcomer gland. And here's one with an ant drinking from the newcomer gland. And another one, this one's after the something from the poor cupola, and this one's after the newcomer gland. Right, now we're going to try and show a video. I hope this works. Um, it worked when we tried it out. Whoops. Um, just now, uh, the other day. So here we go. If you look in this sort of area for the um, tentacle organs being shot out at one point and the reaction of the ants to it. There we are. So do you see that? Um, and then it'll do it again there. So what I'm going to try and do is to grab the slide and just take you through it in a controlled way. There we go. 
So it's a bit like a chimney sweeps brush, isn't it? So it's an irreversible structure with these um, filaments at the end. And as I say, we don't really know what's going on here, but I imagine, or we imagine it's a chemical communication with the ant. So there we are. And uh, then there we go again, out it comes again. So interesting. Right, so if I, yeah, move on. Right, so it's another of the blue butterflies now, the holly blue. So, so we alluded to the Caterpillar Field Guide earlier that I wrote with Phil Sterling and Richard Lewington illustrated. And of all the 800 odd species in there, it was the holly blue I left till last because I think it's just a bit mysterious as to what's going on. So many a book will tell you that the first generation feeds on holly and the second generation on ivy, but it's clearly more complicated than that. So you can find the larvae on ivy buds in sort of late summer, early autumn, by this feeding damage, they, the hole they leave in the, in the flower bud. And there's the caterpillar, which as you can see in itself would be quite difficult to see. And there's another one, a different color form. And one with an ant, and this is the honey gland here. But here's, here's an egg that's been laid on gorse. They're clearly using gorse as a food plant. And in fact, the caterpillar has been found inside the flower of Western gorse. And here is uh, one I found on bramble flowers. So here's an empty eggshell, there's another one there. Here's the first instar larva here. And it's made a little hole in the flower bud of bramble. And they don't go right inside, they just sort of eat out a bit of a cavity, rather like the common blue sticking its front end in. It sticks its front end in and just eats a bit of cavity out there. I don't quite know what they do on Bramble beyond this stage, but uh, it's all very intriguing. And there's one on dogwoods. This one's eaten, e eating dogwood berries. And this one, it's eaten out the contents of this berry. And then there's this pad of silk over the berry over the hole. And here's another pad of silk over the hole that it had made on an ivy bud. Oops, sorry. And so I don't know what's this about. It's just something I've noticed. The silk is spun from the outside. If you open up the bud, there's absolutely nothing inside. It's been eaten out. And I don't think it's the holly blue that's doing it either, because if I bring one into captivity and watch what it does, there's no, no silk appears over the holes. So it's a complete mystery to me and uh, quite difficult to work out how to study it further, to be honest. Anyway, there's a couple of two or three interesting life histories for you. And I'm just gonna to touch briefly on declines of butterflies because butterflies have declined enormously um, in, over the decades. And in fact, the 2015 state of butterflies of um, Britain and United Kingdom, of, um, what's it called, the uh, state of, Britain's Butterflies 2015, um, you can download the report from the Butterfly Conservation website and it shows that overall butterflies have decreased by 70% in terms of their occurrence and 57% in terms of their abundance since 1976. And to go back further beyond that really, you just have anecdotes and this is the marsh fritillary, this is a male this is the female. And when I was researching the Caterpillar book, I came across an account of somebody visiting Northwest Devon in 1957. And he described the marsh fritillary as one of the commonest butterflies in Northwest Devon. There are accounts of people in Ireland barricading their doors to stop the hordes of marsh fritillary larvae entering their houses or sweeping the larvae up into piles and burning them because there were just so many of them. And now the marsh fritillary is so rare that it's got full legal protection. And the Adonis blue, another anecdote, I read an account from 1930 when a chap called DeMuth and Kettlewell of the Peppered Moth fame visited Branscombe and they described the Adonis blue as abundant. Well, it just about exists there still now, but it's extremely rare, very low numbers, and you could never describe it as abundant. So, you know, from the distant past, we just have these anecdotes really. 
And then, you know, switching to the moths, because butterflies and moths are, after all, the same thing. Um, the garden tiger moth has almost disappeared from the deaf and wider countryside, although it's doing OK on our sand dune system still. And the cinnabar moth, yes, you see it. But, you know, in terms of its abundance, it's just so much less common than it used to be. So what can we do about this? Well, the wildlife trusts led by Devon Wildlife Trust have an action for insects campaign. So you can go onto the Devon Wildlife Trust website and click on take action and then choose your action for insects. You can download a free guide as to what you can do to help insects in your garden. And there are a couple of reports there that you can download and read. So I'm, whoops, I'm just going to um, now just concentrate on some things that you can do to, to help butterflies in your garden. So this is my garden and this is some of the things that I've done. So you can leave a bit of your lawn to grow into long grass. And uh, there are several butterflies, particularly the, among the browns, whose caterpillars feed on grass. So there's one, that's the meadow brown caterpillar. And you can go out, these all feed at night. So you have to go out with a torch at night in the spring, but you can find them. And of course you can use my caterpillar field guide, which uh, describes exactly how you can tell one from the other. Or you can collect some common bird's foot trefoil seeds. I've grown some in a pot here. Or you can, you know, grow them in the, you know, in your beds, in your, in, in the garden. But actually, I quite like it in a, in a pot. And the common blue butterflies visit and they lay their eggs on this bird's foot trefoil, and I can watch the caterpillars. And apple trees. So I've got some apple trees and more long grass. And in the autumn, the apples will fall. Some of them rot on the ground. And butterflies like the red admiral and the comma in particular love feeding, gaining sugars from these ripe and rotting apples. People often say, oh, stinging nettles, thinking that small tortoiseshells and peacocks use just common nettles as their food plant. But I don't think you'll get them in your garden like that because they need big patches of nettles in the open. But nevertheless, if you do leave some nettles around the place, you may get a comma butterfly using them as a food plant, or red admiral, or a variety of moths too. And then this is a good plant. This is garlic mustard, the food plant of the orange tip butterfly, which lays its eggs on the flowers or the, and the developing seed pods. And the caterpillars eat mainly the seed pods of garlic mustard. And uh, you you know, you almost inevitably get them laying their eggs in your garden that way. And here's the caterpillar of the orange tip. And nectar source for a wilder area in your garden. Ragwort's a good plant. This clearly isn't in my garden. The co small copper earlier was. This is on the South Devon coast, where there's a couple of small pearl border fritillaries here uh, in a second generation feeding um, from the ragwort flowers. So that's about it really. And um, as I say, that's the, if, if you, I tried Googling big butterfly count earlier and you come with all sorts of, uh, um, you know, ways into it, but this is the one that really gave you the information as to how to uh, submit your records and what you have to do and so on. So if you want to just write that down or take a screenshot or whatever, and, uh, then that's it really so thank you zoe thank you for listening and i'll uh, be ready to take any questions okay fantastic barry so if you could unshare your screen that way people can see you a bit better um thank you very much um just to tell everyone before we go on to the questions that we will provide some links to these kind of main id guides as and like after the event so don't worry about writing it down if you haven't already so as you can imagine, there are quite a few questions, and I personally have quite a few, but I'm <laughs> going to let everyone else start first. So please, can you uh, remain muted and keep your cameras off, for, first of all, and just put your questions in the chat that way we can get through as many as possible. So the first one is, are butterflies pollinators? 
Yes, absolutely they are. Um, and, you know, there are some butterflies with short tongues like the, uh, like the common blue, and there's others with long tongues like the skipper butterflies. In fact, the skipper butterflies have an extension on their pupil case to, uh, to, to enclose the long, the long proboscis. So yes, they certainly are pollinators. Yeah, not all moths are, because not all moths feed uh, as adults. You know, they just rely on flat store, fat stores, but um, butterflies are certainly pollinators. Yeah, and the next question is, is there a chart or table which butterflies go on which trees and flowers? So can, is there a chart to show you where, where they go on, depending on the species? Well, are we talking about food plants, do you think, or, or nectar sources? I mean, I, I suppose take it in two ways. The, I mean, as, in terms of a nectar source, most butterflies aren't too worried about which plant it is, so long as the short-tongued butterflies wouldn't be able to get in a buddleia flower, for example. But um, some, some butterflies as adults don't really feed from flowers. They feed on honeydew, which is the aphid secretion, so, you know, things like the purple hair streak hang around at the top of oak trees and they're just getting their sugars from this aphid secretion. And in terms of the caterpillars, what, um, I mean, any butterfly guide, I think, would tell you what the food plants are. What we did with the caterpillar book um, was to have in the back of it a list of, of the plants and then against each plant are all the species of butterfly and larger moth that feed on that particular plant. That's incredibly helpful. I'm sure that person will very, be very helpful. Uh, so the next question is, what key parts of a caterpillar should you focus on when trying to identify them? Well, yes, interesting. Well, the head colours may help. Um, it will depend. Depends from, from species to, to species, really. Um, all I can say is that uh, the field guide that I've written does have the text which tells you how you can tell one from the other or makes it clear when you can't really tell one from the other. Um, I mean, I think as far as the butterflies themselves, the butterfly caterpillars themselves are concerned, I don't think there's any problem. I mean, you know, you're, you're going to find your white butterfly caterpillars, for example, and then, you know, to distinguish the green veined white caterpillar from the small white caterpillar, the you'd look along the near the spiracles and the markings along where the spiracles are are different on the two. So it, it depends on the on the species and you just have to read the text in the particular, you know, for the particular species you're looking at. And, and the, the field guide also has an at a glance guide. So it'll so you'll get in the right area quite quickly. Yeah. That's brilliant. I think also looking at the type of plant that they're on helps as well, doesn't it? That kind of gives you an idea of narrowing it down. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, what has been eating my gooseberry leaves? Ah, uh, that's not a butterfly or moth. That'll be almost certainly the gooseberry sawfly. So you can put that into Google and see if that looks like what you're seeing. Sawfly larvae have more prolegs than than, cat than caterpillars. And they tend to have a sort of, whereas the caterpillars have sort of six little spots on each side of the head, which are effectively their eyes. The uh, sawflies have, you know, one big spot on each side of the head, which is their eye. And the caterpillars, and again, it's, I can't generalize, but, you know, most caterpillars, they are a large white caterpillar would have prolegs from say on the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and, segments and then the anal clasp is on the 10th. Uh, whereas the sawfly larvae would have um, prolegs on, on more segments than that. Worth a, worth a Google, I'm definitely going to do it after this talk. Yeah, you spiff <laughs> sawfly. Um, so the next question is, the large tortoiseshell has been discovered to recolonize that Dorset in Portland. What yep. do you think of its chances of spreading? I would have thought they're good. I mean, who knows why, why it disappeared? I mean, it's been a sort of temporary resident in this country before. The food plant is elm, and of course, you know, elm took a bashing in the 1970s, but, you know, other species that, 
rely on elm like the white, het white letter hair streak uh, have remained widespread. So, I mean, it may be a climate thing and, uh, you know, it, it may be benefiting from global warming. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, species. We don't really see it much in the butterflies because there aren't many of them, but amongst the moths, you know, the species are colonizing, you know, at quite a rate really, you know. So yeah, I think it's got a good chance to spread. Fantastic. So the next question is, I think I have meadow browns laying eggs in a long grass patch I have left in my garden. Can I cut the grass? And if so, when would it be best? Yes, you can cut the grass because they will spend the uh, daytime really low down and they come up at night to feed. So, so as long as you don't give it a crew cut, you should be all right, you know, do a reasonably high cut and, and I imagine it'll be fine. I mean, you can you can go out at night, as I say, with a torch and have a look for the caterpillars. They'll be too, they'll be very small now until next spring. But uh, yeah, I I've, I th I think that'd be fine. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, the next question is: I want to do this count with my class as a mellow last day activity. Afternoon is afternoon a go okay time to do it? And where in Starcross would be best? Sorry, can you just repeat the start of that? Uh, so they want to do the uh, count, the big butterfly count with yes. their class, but when they they're asking if afternoon would be best. Oh, I see. Um, across a good place to do it. Well, it doesn't really matter what time of day, so long as the sun's shining. To be honest, yeah. Mm -hmm. So morning or afternoon, it doesn't really matter. And sorry, going back to the previous question as well, what, what, when should it be cut? I mean, I think you know, I I would I should have thought a cut in September would be fine, and um, yeah. Uh, the next question is, does cutting long grass in August disturb the life cycle of butterflies like meadow brown or ringlet? <laughs> well, I think it probably doesn't a great deal, as long as you don't cut it too short. Um, but I, you know, it's just a feeling I have because the caterpillars, as I say, spend the day low down. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the large skipper larvae will be they, they're mainly on coxfoot and they they make a little hypernaculum sort of a bit up off the ground um for the winter but yeah i don't know it's it's difficult i think as far as the meadow browns are concerned i wouldn't have thought cutting the grass in august provided you don't make it too low and you leave some and it's not just brown what you leave there's some green greenery there then that I would have thought would be all right. Yes, I think you're right. And I think on a, on a personal note, we tend to advise that grass is left sort of in the spring and early summer months when they're starting to sort of come out of their chrysalis and need food, food sources or that butterflies and other pollinators. So sort of towards the autumn and winter is sort of a less kind of uh, a less kind of critical time in terms of cutting grass. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, what do you think about collect children collecting caterpillars to rear into adults? I used to do this as a kid and learned a lot from it, but I'm not sure it's, sure it's still a good idea. Well, it depends what you're collecting. I mean, if you, you know, if it's a rare species from a particular habitat that's a habitat specialist, then it's not a good idea. But, you know, for our common wider countryside butterflies, I, I think it's fine. I mean, you're going to release these things again. They've probably got a better chance of survival in captivity than they have in the in the wild. And, you know, it'll hopefully engender, you know, an interest in the children and, um, you know, make them passionate about wildlife and want to conserve it in the future. So I, uh, I, I can't see a problem in, you know, red admiral caterpillars are easy to find. They, they pot up a nettle leaf um and you just got to look for those feeding signs and uh you know they're pretty common easy to find easy to rear and um you can just let them go again excellent and the next question is are there any negative effects of bud leer yes <laughs> it's a it's a horrid invasive weed when it gets out on the cliffs and the countryside but of course, in the in gardens, it's uh, it's lovely because it attracts the butterflies, and the butterflies love it. But it's a horrid invasive weed in the countryside. 
It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because I know it can yeah. be problematic in walls as well. So yeah. there is a balance to be um, brought there. The next question is, last year we had nearly 50 red admirals on our new decking. I'm guessing they were after the wood sap. That's interesting. Maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know. They might have just been after moisture. But, um, you know, I see moths at night just feeding from birch twigs in the spring. And so there must there must be some sugars there being secreted that the, the butterflies are using. So I don't know why they're um, on your decking, but uh, yeah. <laughs> They must, be getting some, they must be getting some benefit from it, mustn't they? Perhaps it's partly the sort of absorbing the heat. Yeah. Maybe. Well, it may be, yeah. yeah. Um, the next question is, which plants provide the most and mo most accessible nectar? Well, I don't really know. I know ragwort is a very good nectar source. Um, and as I say, different butterflies can cope with different plants. For example, the short tongue butterflies can't cope with buddleia. So um, yeah, I, you know, just, just have a variety of, of different flowers, I would say. I mean, that wheat's good, um, thistles are good, um, ragwort, uh, yeah. All, herb all that plants sort of are thing. quite good as well, aren't they? Herb, herb plants. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's true. Yeah, marjoram. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. That's what the small tortoiseshell I showed was, was on. Yeah. Um, the next question is, aphids are normally pests, but with butterflies feeding on their secretion, they have some positive effect. Perhaps we shouldn't be killing them. Well, maybe not, but I suppose the, the, um, the, uh, the aphid secretion that they're using are aphids up in trees rather than on, on the ground. So you, you, well, you just have to balance, don't you? I mean, the you know, ladybirds eat aphids and, and have some hoverfly larvae eat aphids. So, you know, aphids are part of the, um, the, the, the web of life out there. But I think sometimes we encourage them by the things we grow. I think it's a difficulty, isn't it? Because if you've got a diversity of plants and insects, then there is that food web. But when you've got one monoculture of plants, then the aphids can take over and there's not the sort of necessary benefit brought to butterflies and other yeah. insects. That's absolutely right. Um, the next question is, what keeps nibbling around the edge of my pansy flowers? I don't know. Um, if it's not apparent by day, go out with a torch by night and have a look. You Thank probably you. find the culprit then. Do a bit of investigation. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, is your field guide on caterpillars only Dorset specific or is it UK wide? It's UK wide, UK and Ireland. Fantastic. And the next question is, do extended periods of summer rain adversely affect butterflies? Well, yes. I mean, I think it's, there's no simple answer to that. Some may benefit from it. Some may not do so well from it. You know, so the, I guess the white admiral, whose larvae are struggling on scrappy honeysuckle with the leaves dropping off in woodland, um, because it's so dry, might benefit from, I don't know, but they might benefit from a, from a, from a wet August. But, uh, you know, those butterflies that happen to be on the wing specifically in August are going to have less time in which they can, you know, find a mate and lay eggs and so on. So there's, there's, no, there's no one answer that fits all, I'm afraid. Fantastic. Well, I think that concludes the rest of my the sort of end of the talk. Um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to everyone. Those talk, those questions were certainly brilliant questions and very been fantastic at answering them. There's not always an easy answer to everything. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, a lot of our insect species, regardless of their sort of spread, um, sort of with climate change, are declining. And in fact, about 41% of them are at risk of extinction. So as Barry mentioned, um, the way we can combat that is by taking action for insects. If you download your free guide, you get a lot of re really useful advice about what you can do in your homes and your communities. So I really would recommend that as a sort of starting point for how you can help insects thrive. And there's a lot of useful information on our website about sort of which plants are really useful for butterflies as well. So I can send a link to that at the af after the talk. Yes, as I say, thank you again to our speaker and thank you to you all. 
if you enjoyed our talk, we've got another one uh, up in a few weeks on the 4th of August, um, all about sharks. So sharks are not the sort of demons that they've been portrayed in the sort of media and um, in our sort of common literature. They're very important for our oceans um, and sort of maintaining ocean health. And if you'd like to find more about their behaviours and how we might aid their conservation, feel free to book. So thanks again to everyone. Thank you to our speaker. It's been fascinating. Personally, I hadn't heard of the term aerial latrine, so I've learned something today. And good evening to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Can I just say that we one thing I didn't mention in the talk in terms of gardens is avoid using pesticides, of course. Exactly. And that is also mentioned in our action for insects guide. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.